Johnny Lingo was the shrewdest trader on the islands of Kiniwata and Nurabandi. Everybody thought he could marry any woman on the islands he wanted to. That why, that's why it was kind of a surprise that he chose Sarita. Now to Sarita, to be kind, she was, she was not the most attractive woman on the island. She kind of walked around with her head hung down, her hair hanging in her face, kind of as if she was ashamed. She was tall, slender, kind of shoulders slumped over, and yet Johnny loved her. Now, the way that you would ask for a bride's hand in marriage in those South Pacific islands of Kiniwata and Nurabandi is you would approach the father of the bride and you would, you would do bargaining with him. And you would use cattle. Two cows represented an average wife, three cows above average, four cows superior. One cow was just kind of a token gift. Now, Sarita's father, his name was Sam Carew. Sam Carew had been told by his friends that you would be lucky if you would just get one cow for your daughter, Sarita. The day of bargaining was to be done. Johnny Lingo came from his island of Nurabandi over to Kiniwata, came into Sam Carew's hut, but there was no bargaining to be done today. Because Johnny Lingo walked in and said, Sam Carew, I will purchase your daughter for eight cows. Now, if Johnny Lingo was a laughing stock before, he was really a laughing stock now. Eight cows? I, and nobody had ever purchased a wife for eight cows previously. This was the all time record. They got married. Nine months went by. Everybody on the island of Kiniwata had not seen um, Johnny or Sarita for the past nine months. But now it was festival time. And it was time for the families to come back together on this island, and so now Johnny and, and Sarita came over, and they, they got on their canoe, and Sarita gathered some covered dishes, and they boarded their little canoe in the lagoon there. Johnny said, I've got some business to tend to here in the lagoon, and so he sent Sarita on to her family's house with her covered dishes. Interesting thing, as Sarita began to walk through the village, everybody just stopped and stared. They'd never seen anything like it. One of Johnny's old friends came up to him in the lagoon and said, Is that Sarita? He was so surprised. And Johnny, just beaming, said, I see you approve. And he said, I don't mean to be forward, but she's beautiful. She's glorious. What, what do you attribute to this? And Johnny said, When my Sarita was growing up, she thought she was only worth one cow. And I wanted her to feel more valuable than any woman on the islands. I wanted her to feel like an eight-cow woman. Men, today you have an assignment if you're married. Sometime through the course of the day, go up to your bride and say, Honey, you are an eight-cow woman. You know, it's interesting, there's a husband in the story, there isn't there, but there's also another character in the story. There's a father. And, and Sarita had grown up thinking that she was only worth one cow. You know, I think when it comes to family, when it comes to marriage, in the world in which we live, we want promises. Will you give me some sort of promise so that my family will turn out perfectly? And God doesn't give us promises. What he does is he gives us principles to follow. What I want to do is I want to speak about some of these principles. Because I believe that God has, if you look and you glean from the scriptures, God has a plan for this thing called marriage and family. And by the way, let me give some disclaimers. If you are single, you might think, oh, no, they're catering to the married people again. You need to understand something. If you are a believer and you're a mature believer in the world in which you live, God placed you here to influence. And because you're single right now doesn't mean you won't be single forever. But even if you do remain single forever, you still have a voice and you still have an influence. Because even in your singleness, which is a holy, high, wonderful thing, 
is that your singleness flows out of what I'm going to talk about even today. In 1899, there were four reporters representing four different newspapers in Denver. During that time, there was a lack of big news to report. And they were writing for the Times, the Republican, the Rocky Mountain News, the Post. And so they got together in a pub in Denver, Colorado, and, and all for the purpose, over a few cold ones, to, to develop a story to sell newspapers. That was their sole objective. So this was the story that they came up with, totally fabricated. Gathering in this pub, the, the story was that American engineers were on their way to China to destroy the Great Wall of China to represent an open door of free trade from the west to the east. Well, it was totally fabricated. But they wrote about it in their papers. The next morning, the story on some of the headlines re read, Peking seeks world trade. The story spread east and then eventually to the Far East. Well, when it, the Chinese government, when they heard that American engineers were on their way to destroy their Great Wall, they became enraged. As a result, the, the government attacked foreign embassies and murdered hundreds of missionaries in country. And over the next six months, 12,000 troops from six different countries invaded Ke Peking and put down what our history books call the Boxer Rebellion. It was a horrible plan, and the long-term consequences were devastating. In the same way, the world's had a plan for marriage and family, and the plan had no concern for the long-term consequences. Let me remind you, we've become high-tech, all the while we are low-touch. We saw in our generation, we saw free sex ushered in, and now we realize it's not free at all, it's costing us dearly. Relational consequences have left children in single-parent homes, and physical consequences have left us little hope for modern med medical miracles. The world's plan for family has obviously failed, and this leaves us with few options to turn to with, for answers. Fortunately, there is a plan that God has outlined for us to accomplish. It's His purposes for family and for marriage. Because God knows we need a plan that's timeless, yet meets the needs of 2018, 2019, and beyond. And what we see in God's Word is that it works. It's practical. I believe that it's true, but it's true and it works. It's not just works, so hey, let's give it a shot. It's truth, and yet it's the most practical thing we can live by. This morning, I want to open up God's Word and I think one of the foundational principles of all of culture and society. And what we're going to see is God's plan involves three responsibilities on our part. Those three responsibilities are simply leave, cleave, become one flesh. It comes out of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Let me read to you, and I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Translation. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, For this cause, now by the way, context, this is creation, this is foundational. Before there were, it was any institution that God created, this was the institution that he created. He says, For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So let's dissect this. I believe that God has called us. Our first responsibility is to leave. Leaving must be done in the context of honor of our parents. Now, in Genesis 2.24, it's talking to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they don't have parents. God created them miraculously. They're the first creatures on the planet. They're the first man and woman. And so the application for them to leave father and mother is obviously for all of their descendants and all their generation, including you and me. Well, how do you leave your father and mother? Well, leaving must be done in the context of honoring your parents. One of the things that we're going to be arguing for is that, you know, when a man and a woman become husband and wife, a mystery happens. They're no longer two individuals, but they're one. It's a mystery. 
and it's to show off what God is like. Because God is one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. He's one. I remember in seminary they said, oh, well, that's called the hypostatic union. And I thought, well, that's real helpful. <laughs> Given it some definition doesn't make us understand it anymore. But the greatest picture of what God is like is supposed to be shown off in a marriage between a man and a woman. It's foundational to culture. And, and all relationships need to revolve around that husband-wife oneness. But how do you honor your parents? Well, I think you honor your parents by making wise, practical decisions to show that they raised you in an honorable way. You live the next best right thing type of ethic, and that honors your parents because that reveals that your parents raised you appropriately. In the same way, we need to be, we need to be aware of being over-dependent on parents. Now, I'm not talking about alone in a time of occasional need. What I'm talking about is your parents enabling you to continue to make mistakes and them continuing to bail you out from your poor choices. That's not honoring your parents. How do you honor your parents? Well, you do the next best right thing. Now, in this leaving, I want, to, I want you to understand the primary relationship in the family is the marriage. I remember when... Our, our son, who's single, uh, 28 now, when he was just a three or four, he asked this question. And, and if you've got kids in that range, they've asked this question to you. He asked, do you love me? This is Blake, my three-year-old at the time talking. Do you love me more than mommy? No. The greatest gift you can give your children is the love that you have for one another. Because you see, what you will never be one with your children, but you're one with each other. And the greatest security that kids will glean from you is the security they see from mom and dad. The greatest gift you can give your children. See, kids are not meant to get in the way of your marriage. Your marriage is meant to get in the way of your kids. And we live in a culture where it's like, oh, let's cater to the kids all the time sacrificing marriage. And see, kids are not meant to get in the way of your marriage. Your marriage is meant to get in the way of your kids. See, you're one with each other. You're not responsible for your children's happiness. I tell couples all the time when I do their pre-marriage counseling, you are not responsible for your parents' happiness. Therefore, parents, don't make your kids responsible for your happiness. Now, here's the remarriage dilemma. By the way, years ago, there was very little out there in terms of Christian input for remarried situations. And so Christian couples that were remarried kind of had to filter through and make ends meet on their own. There's a fellow by the name of Ron Deal. You can get on the web. He's pretty much created a whole paradigm of biblical input for remarried couples. But here's the remarriage dilemma. Many times a, a couple, they get remarried, and what happens is you bring in your previous families into the mix, and you've got kids by a previous marriage, and your kids were there before your marriage. And so it's easy to sacrifice marriage on the altar of, well, these kids were with me before. And again, you need to understand something. You, you're not one with your children. You're one with your spouse. And the greatest gift you can give, even in that remarriage situation, is the love that you have for one another. So he creates this paradigm. First, job one, leave. All other relationships must revolve around the epicenter of all relationships, and that's the marriage. That's the wife and the husband marriage relationship. The degree with which you leave is the degree to which you live out the second principle, cleave. Notice again in Genesis 2.24, says again, For this cause a man shall leave his mother, father, mother and father and shall cleave to his wife. I remember when I first heard that word, I was thinking, you remember your parents used to have a meat cleaver. Well, that's not exactly what this word means. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a word that means to super glue together. I, I, this past week, I, I knew I was obviously speaking on this, and so I got a 
two sheets of paper, and it's stereotypically, you know, pink and blue. And so don't make more of that than it is. It's just the difference between, you know, you've got a man and a woman. What happens in the union of marriage, it's like you take this man and you take this woman and they're super glued together. And what I went down and Don, I, I raided the uh, kids' closet down there and got some Elmer's glue and just kind of went to town squirting it freely where it kind of bled over and it was fun. And then I glued it together and this is like a piece of concrete. You, you can't pull this apart. And what happens, there's a mystery that happens in the act of marriage, is that a man and a woman, they come together and they're cloven, they're cleaved to one another. Dr. Spencer Silver in 1968 was trying to invent this super glue, this super strong adhesive, and he failed miserably. It had a long shelf life, but it didn't do the trick in terms of permanently gluing something. And what he found was that he'd put it together and then it would pull apart. But it had a long life, but it just didn't seal things together permanently. So he takes this super glue that he invented in 1968. He puts it on the shelf of 3M, kind of marks it as glue failure. 1977 rolls around. There's a guy who's in the marketing department. His name is Art Fry. Art Fry sings in his church choir. And so Art Fry had a hymnal, and he knew each week he would sing a different hymn. And so he would take this piece of paper, and he found this glue, and he would wipe it on the back of pieces of scratch paper, and he would put it in his hymnal. And then he would be able to find the hymn, the next hymn that they were singing. And then the next week, he could take that same piece of paper and then put it in another hymn, and then he could just keep planting it from page to page. And he had an idea. He was looking out his office at 3M, and there was this warehouse there that was throwing away large chunks and sheets, stocks of yellow legal pad. And so he had an idea. What if I take that legal pad and I cut it up into squares and take some of that glue and mark it and just kind of put it on the periphery and then you could just stick it on something. And then you could kind of stick it on something again. So they did a trial. They put together a bunch of these and they did a trial in Boise, Idaho and it was 94% successful. That's why your post-it notes are on yellow. You ever wonder why they're on yellow? Because the original paper was on yellow. Now you can get them on blue, green, whatever. You know, I think in our culture today, we cleave with the persistence of a post-it note. We, we come together, oh, till death do us part, until a new deal comes along. And then we peel off, and then we reattach ourselves to something else or someone else. That's not the biblical definition of cleave. The biblical definition of cleave is one of permanence. It's one of a till death do us part. God created Adam with an unmet need. I want to show you in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18... I want to go back on a field trip, back in creation. You can read from the screen. I like to kind of hold the word in my hand here. It's like an old ball glove. In 2.18, it says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now think about this. In creation, God's created the world. It's the sixth day. Everything is good. Sin has not entered the world yet, and yet God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Sin hasn't entered the world, and yet God says it's not good. Why is it not good? Well, because Adam needs a helper, a helper that's suitable for him. And so God's going to show Adam his need. How's he going to do that? Well, look at verse 19 and 20. 
It says, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. This is brilliant. Because God has given Adam a job to do. He's given him work, and it's out of that work that he's going to learn something so profound. And so he's given, been given the job. Here's all these animals. And I want you to name them. Look at verse 20. And the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But as he's naming these animals, Adam is observing something. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Now think about this. God is going to expose Adam's need through his job. So he's naming the animals. Bull, cow, buck, doe, ram, you. You get the picture? They got buddies, and he's thinking, I don't have a buddy. And they're off in the bushes having a heck of a lot more fun than I'm having. It's okay to laugh in church. He's observing something. You got a bull, and you got a cow, and they're compatible, and I don't have somebody who's compatible with me. And so God exposes this need. Now let's continue to read on. Look at verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed the flesh at that place. And out of this rib, it says in verse 22, and the Lord God fashioned. It literally means from someone for someone. That from this man... God creates something for this man. It's poetry. It's really beautiful. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. This is the first wedding ceremony. And I don't mean any disrespect in that whatsoever. This is holy ground where this man who's been alone, who names the animals, notices I've got a need and these animals don't meet it. And then all of a sudden, God brings this beautiful creature and presents her to him. It's the first wedding ceremony where the eternal father is giving the bride to the groom. And the question would be, would he receive her as God's perfect provision for him? And notice verse 23. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's beautiful. And this is the cornerstone principle of family. Not only marriage, but family. To receive each other as God's perfect provision for you. Just as God orchestrated this family, God orchestrated your family together. You didn't get together by accident. God in his providential mercy brought you together for such a time as this. What was the basis of their reception? Now think about this. Adam has a choice. Will he receive Eve? Well, what's he receive her based upon? She hadn't done anything for him. His reception of her was totally based upon the one he did know in the equation and who he knew was God. And he knew that God's character was good and that he was pure and that he was holy. And so he received Eve, not based upon what anything that she had done, but based upon the reception of God's character. See, reception is not based upon your spouse's performance. There's a difference between reception and acceptance. Acceptance is just kind of tolerating. Oh, uh, I guess I'll just accept old Claude because nobody else is coming along. Reception is wholeheartedly receiving something as God's perfect provision for you. So he says, leave, job one. Cleave together. Have an unbreakable bond. And then third responsibility is to experience one flesh. Again, Genesis 2.24. It says this, for the man, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And please understand, becoming one flesh is not just getting married, it's not just having sex, it's a process that helps us grow as we were intended. 
The physical expression of that is a visual aid for what God wants us to experience in every area of our lives. God wants us to experience a holy intercourse mentally, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. You have to ask the question, why did God create man and woman to be one? And the reason is, it's because it's a reflection of who God is. See, God creates us to mirror what he is like. The high and holy calling of marriage and family is marriage was created to tell the truth about God. And what is God like? Well, God is one. God is holy. God is good. God is forgiving. God is compassion. God is fair. God is kind. God is grace. God is mercy. All of that was to be manifest in this oneness relationship, to tell the truth about God. See, so just to have physical sex cheapens what we were created to be. Physical sex is, is a small part of the bigger picture. Let me give you a forecast of, let me put this talk on hold a second and give you a forecast of where I'm going to be going starting on January 20th. Because I'm going to do something that's totally out of the realm of, can they do that at church? Let me give you a quote. There's a guy by the name of Gary Thomas. He's a pastor. And I quote, he says this, any honest observer must realize that there seems to be a concerted effort in most forms of entertainment and the media to promote an image and purpose of sexuality that radically is at odds with biblical teaching and historic Christian practice. Dr. Julie Slattery, an expert on human sexuality, said this. She says, we have been sexually discipled by the world. Philip Yancey said this, and I quote, I know of no greater failure among Christians than in presenting a persuasive approach to sexuality. See, the church hasn't talked about it. And we have to ask the question, okay, when it comes to human sexuality, where are you going to get good information? You're not going to get it in the school. You're not going to get it on the street. You're not going to get it on television. You've been discipled in how to think about sexuality and think of the scars of our culture because of it. And yet God isn't silent on it. Right now, there's a huge thing. It's called, it's called gender dysphoria. You know what dysphoria means? Dysphoria means a state of unease or generalized dissatisfaction. We live in a culture where people all of a sudden, gender, I'm not satisfied with my gender, so I'm going to change my gender. And then we give small children the right to change their gender as if they're really thinking clearly about this. See, we need to understand something. We were created in the image of God. As, as a result of that, we are a temple of God. And, and as a temple of God, God has boundaries that were created by him. And always throughout scripture, God gives intention before he gives expression. And so God always gives us an ought before we carry out our want. And now we live in a culture that says, wait a minute, I have a want. Okay, well, that just precedes everything. No, God's word gives us an ought before we are controlled by our want. See, because if I'm just controlled by my want, then, gosh, all hell breaks loose. Katie, bar the door. I mean, it's just like I, I can do whatever I want to with whoever I want to, just eat cherry pie all day long. And, and what's up with that? You become your own worst enemy. God gives us boundaries because he says, I love you, and this is your ought. But yet I've got these cravings. So? All of us have cravings. But you were created in the image of God. You're not an animal. You have a self-will. You have an ability to say no to your cravings because your cravings are not always what's best for you, are they? Starting on January 20th, I'm going to do something. I'm going to start a series. It'll probably go for six to eight weeks or so on human sexuality. And some of you, oh, no, 
have earplugs for the kids. Hey, you know what? I, I'm not going to say anything. That, it's not going to have charts up here, body parts or anything. It's not going to be... It's not going to be rude. It's not going to be out of context. It's going to be incredibly educational from God's perspective. It's not going to be crude. It's not going to be rude. Because I believe that the Bible has a model for us so that we think rightly and therefore behave. Hey, let me let you in on this. M most of your children have already heard a lot worse, a lot more provocative stuff than what I'm going to be talking about. But we need God's perspective. God's not afraid to talk about this. What God created many times, we're afraid to talk about. And if we're not going to hear truth from here, we're not going to hear it from out there. Now, I'm giving you a warning on this. So some of you, if you know, you can judge accordingly. We'll make, we'll throw candy bars in the gym and let your kids just eat candy for an hour while we're in here together. And it was supposed to be funny. But I believe that so many of our problems are self-induced because of our view is so wrong when it comes to sexuality. Let me get back to this message. So that's January 20th. I'm giving you a heads up. Leave, cleave, become one flesh. That's God's plan for marriage and the family. Why is it so difficult to experience? Here's the reason it is so difficult to experience. There is an evil being that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. See, let's go all the way back in time. Before the world was created, Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 40, 14 paints the picture. Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14 paints the picture that God is in the heavenlies. Everything in, in heaven is in perfect unity. God the Father, God the Son, uh, God the Spirit are in perfect unity with one another. And, and the angelic beings, and yet there's an angelic being who thinks, I want his job. He's beautiful. And he tries to usurp God's authority, and God can have no evil in his presence. And so God kicks him out of eternity. He's got to have a place to kick him, and so he creates planet Earth. And that's where we pick up Genesis chapter 1. And so God creates this world and kicks this evil being out onto this planet called planet Earth. And God says, I've got a long-term plan. I'm going to destroy this evil being, and I'm going to send this invasionary force. Adam and Eve, you and me, man and woman. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And Satan looks and goes, this is who you invaded the planet with? Ha! <laughs> I can make them stumble. I can own them. And he calls them to fall. And Satan thinks, I've won a major victory. All he's done is fall. He's fallen into God's great grand plan because a descendant of Eve will end up destroying this evil being. You know him as Jesus when Jesus hung on the cross. It's a masterful plan. It's God's plan and how he chose to execute it, but the reason that you're miserable is that you have an evil being that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. See, you need to understand something. Family takes place on a spiritual battlefield, not on a romantic balcony, and as a result of this spiritual war, this evil one wants to disrupt this leave, cleave, and become one plan. How does he do it? Well, the evil one uses our natural differences Weaknesses and selfishness. See, our differences, God created us male and female. He created us that way so that we could complete one another, not compete with one another. There's something in our maleness and there's something in our femaleness that together we reflect more of who God is than we can on our own individually. And the evil one wants us to compete with each other, not to complete one another. See, you remember when I said, if you were here in Advent, when Jesus came, Jesus invaded this planet to win the war between good and evil. And every conflict we have comes from this good, evil war. Here's our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is our natural self-centeredness. 
I want you to do something. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to say, I'm selfish too. G.K. Chesterton said this, one time he was asked, what's the problem with the world? And Chesterton, without hesitation, he said, it's me. It's us. It's you. It's me. It's our sin capacity. And Jesus is the only one that can remedy the problem. And that's why Paul writes the result of this transformative work of the cross. He writes in Galatians 2.20, he says, when I place my faith in Christ, what happens is this, I learn to die with Christ. And then it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives through me. That's the only way for culture, society, for marriage, for family to even have a a chance of survival. And see, for for Dan and Julie, for our marriage to succeed, it's got to be a daily. Dan's got to die to Dan and Julie's got to die to Julie. I look back on our 35 years of marriage, and the times of our biggest conflict is when Dan doesn't die to Dan. It's when Dan is selfish. Only way out of the hole is die to yourself. To be unaware of our own selfishness is a death sentence to possible unity in our families. See, when we begin to turn on our spouse And our family members, what happens is, and by the way, most counseling sessions, most counseling sessions start off like this, where somebody is coming in and they want to convince the counselor of how bad the other family member is. And until they understand the other family member is not the problem, guess who the problem is? You, me. And if you deal, if you die to yourself and your spouse dies to yourself and your family member dies to yourself then you've got a a chance of success if you allow Jesus to live through you. And when we turn on our spouse or a family member as the problem, what we're doing is we're ultimately rejecting God and his provision for our life. We reflect negatively on the character of God. We, we, We reflect unbelief and disobedience towards God. We're saying, I've got a better idea about how God's plan works than than God's plan. And when we turn on one another, we we fail to fulfill God's plan for marriage because this was God's idea. See, I want you to think for a second. The person you're sitting next to, your spouse, your family members, are not your enemy. You do have an enemy. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you to think that you have an enemy called your spouse, but that's not your enemy. No two people are perfectly compatible. The issue is not compatibility. The issue is commitment. Here's the application. Just as Adam received Eve as God's perfect provision for your life, you know the application for you is to receive your family members as God's perfect provision for you. It starts in your marriage. To receive your spouse as God's perfect provision for you. Not just to accept, not just to tolerate, but to receive wholeheartedly. For kids, your application is to receive your parents as God's perfect provision for you. God put them over you to guide you to to the next best right thing. And to receive them as God's perfect provision for you. As an act of your will, you've got to... Receive, not just accept your spouse, your children, as God's gift made personally for you. I tell this story every year, and I promise I'm going to tell it every year. I seriously do. I tell it about every year about this time, and I'm going to tell it next year about this time. So if you've heard it before, get over it. I grew up in a background Lawrence, Kansas. Dad was disabled, no fault of his. He was always in and out of the hospital. And so um, my dad's parents, my grandparents, lived in Eureka, Kansas. Anybody know where Eureka is? You know where it is. Little small cow town, 50 miles east of Wichita. You can go to the cemetery there in Eureka, and you can see my grandparents, both sets of my grandparents are there about, oh, about 20 yards apart. How rare is that in the world in which we live? One cemetery, that's my family heritage right there. 
I would spend large chunks of time with my grandparents growing up when my dad was sick and my mom, my, my mom, I saw her graduate when I was nine years old from the University of Kansas because she knew she needed to get a college degree to teach, to be able to make ends meet for my brother and I because dad was always in and out of the hospital. I saw her at 19, she got her master's degree, she just kept chipping away at it. I never knew she was in college when she was going through it because she just kept doing it. She just chopped wood when we were doing our thing because she had, fa- she, had to have, she had to feed mouths. But the people that really shaped me in these values were my grandparents. I can remember going and seeing them. They, they lived in a double-wide trailer on a little body of water called the Eureka Lake. And I would go and I would spend large chunks of time. To me, that was a castle of goodness. They were kind, they were gracious, it was, they were nourishing, it was fun. My grandfather taught me how to drive a stick shift. We bought a 1947 Chevrolet pickup together. I was with him when he bought it. I can still remember, I can still see the ink drying on the check. He wrote it out for $100. He bought this 1947 piece of junk. He, he taught me how to drive a stick on that thing. That became our vehicle where we would go around and to all these little ponds in the area and we would catch fish. He taught me how to clean a fish. He, 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 he was a man's man. He, was a, he didn't have a career. He had jobs. You remember that? You remember that era? What, what do you do for a living? I, I work. He had jobs. He had strong hands, workman hands. He would work long hours, but I never, he always had time for me. We'd get up early in the morning and we'd go f- catch fish and come back and we'd fry up these fish and my grandmother would make them, you know, with that cornmeal batter and fry them up and in this double wide trailer, there was a table that was attached to the trailer and had three seats on it. I would sit here, my grandfather would sit here at the head, my grandmother would sit over here. And I can remember, this is where we don't just teach people, we mark them. You don't just teach people, you mark them with your life. And I can remember, she were putting that big old plate of that fried catfish and bass and, and crappie, just putting it down on the table. And I can remember her coming up behind my grandfather, wrapping her arms around him, kissing him on top of his bald head and looking at me. I can it's, I'm marked by it. And saying, do you know how crazy I am about this old guy? I have goosebumps right now. We don't just teach people, we mark them. And we're foolish to think otherwise. See, as more is caught than is formally taught. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to shake hands. He, when he shook somebody's hand, he'd hold out his hand like that and shake it. I wanted to be like him. But what defined him was how he loved my grandmother. It was 1995. It was the last time I saw my grandfather living. My grandmother had contacted Alzheimer's. I don't know, you don't don't contact Alzheimer's disease. You come down with it. Where you basically emotionally go backwards, right? And he could no longer, in his later, mid-80s, he could no longer take care of her physical needs, so they needed to move into a nursing home. Typical-looking nursing home, 2,000-member town. And so I remember going into this nursing home, 1995, to see him. I knew it was probably going to be the last time I saw him. I walk in the lobby, and there's my grandmother. She didn't recognize me because of the consequences of Alzheimer's disease. And and you need to understand, when it was time to move her into the nursing home, he not only packed her bags, he packed his bags, he moved in with her, even though they said, you don't need to move in here here with your wife. And he's like, are you kidding me? And this was his response. He said, I I made a commitment to her, till death do us part. In sickness and in health, till death do us part. My place is with her. Men, there's not a woman in here that doesn't want to be loved that way. And so he moved into the nursing home with us. So I, I go into the nursing home. He knows that I'm coming. 
I walk into the room where he is. He's sitting in that dog-eared recliner, you know, the one that's got duct tape on the arm. And I walk in. I say, Granddad, it's Dan. And he starts struggling to stand up. You know, by this time, he's, he's about 5'5", five, five, 120 pounds, body just withered over. He knew I was coming, so he had on his slacks and, you know, his suspenders. He, he pulled up about here, you know, his pants. And I walked over, and he's struggling to stand, and I just walked over, and I just kind of pulled him up and held him there for a second. Two words for time, and I tell this to my couples that I, that I marry there's two words in the scripture for time. There's chronos time that we're enslaved to. There's kairos time that are, are moments that hang in eternity. And this was a kairos moment where I'm holding my grandfather and I pulled him back and I had never said this to him. And I said, Granddad, thank you for loving my grandmother the way you've loved her. And I literally did this. I said, you marked me. And I did this with my hands. I am different. And this was 1995 that I'm saying this. I am different, but my children will be different, and my children's children will be different. And you know what? Today, in 2018, that's true. My children are different, and my children's children are different because of how he chose to love my grandmother. See, it makes a difference. What you do today makes a huge difference tomorrow, and tomorrow will be here before you know it. That's why... Our life is a vapor. And I said, I thank you for loving me and loving my grandmother, and I'm different. And we talked for a couple hours. I had to go. I remember walking out of that room and looking back at my grandfather, and I thought, a size of a man can never be judged on their physical stature. It's got to be judged on their character. And he had it. He was true to his word, and he had received his wife at one year of marriage, at 10 years of marriage, at 20 years, of, and at this point, 62 years of marriage. And so I'm marked by that. And now, several years later, you're marked by it. And remember what I said is our mission is to send messages to places we will never go. And Lee Brenton. Never left, never saw the ocean, never saw Canada, never left the four-state area of in and around Kansas is now making an impact. His story is making an impact on you because of how he chose to live his life, because he, choos he chose to follow biblical principles. See, again, I'm asking you to receive one another as God's perfect provision for you. Why? Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. And that's what the Bible says. You want to empty yourself, you want to find your life, you, want to, you, you need to lose it. You need to receive one another as God's perfect provision for you. Let me close my time. You remember I had this little piece of paper, this little illustration of what happens when, when a man and a woman are brought together in the act of marriage and it's this beautiful thing. We're no longer two, we're one. God's plan has meaning and purpose, and you want to try and break God's plan? This is what happens when you try and break God's plan. You tear apart that which was never intended to be torn apart. That's a picture of our culture and how we choose to live out family. We tear apart that which was never intended to tear apart because we think we've got a better plan. See, God doesn't give us promises. He gives us principles. See, I hope you hear my heart in this. That's why we've got to talk about human sexuality because if we don't talk about it, the culture is going to come, continue to come in and steal, kill, and destroy your family. And then we're going to look around and go, wow, I don't understand what's going on. And yet, God's given us the why. God's given us understanding. But we've got to glean from him to understand.
if we believe rightly, then it increases the odds that we will behave correctly. If we believe wrongly, which our culture is, then it will lead to incredibly increased more poor behavior. And we will continue to see the results that we see. See, our culture is perfectly organized to see its current reality. The world has discipled it in how to live out their sexuality. And that's why at the church, we, we've got to be able to say, no, we've, we've got the blueprint for answers. God, we don't have to look any further than your holy word for answers, for truth, for guidance, for that which is purpose and meaning. God, I pray that this semester that you would do a great work in us. Not folks in our culture in Grand Island who have thought wrongly about this whole arena of our human sexuality so that Lord we would think rightly and we would behave correctly so that we would manufacture 62 year kind of marriages we would manufacture right thinking in the next generation so that children would be equipped when they go off to college to be able to stand up and go, I, I believe in God, you don't. And to be able to stand firmly on the word of God and handle it accurately and correctly. Lord, we've never intended to grope in the dark for answers. All we have to do is walk in the light of your word. And that's what we intend to do. We've gathered together this morning on the precipice of a new year. And I pray for your blessings in 2019, not in terms of material wealth, not in terms of ease and comfort, but in 2019, Lord, would you use us more than we ever thought we could be used? Would you teach us to think more deeply than we ever thought we could think? Would you push us to be holy because your word is holy because you are holy? Would you teach us to love this culture so that we know what in the world to do with the word in the world in which we live? So that people are different as a result of how we live and how we love. I ask you this in Jesus' matchless holy name. All God's people said, amen. The ushers will take up the offering now. I would ask you to remain seated. Until that plate passes you by, and then stand and join us. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life. In you, death has lost its sting. Though I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares. To your embrace, light of the world forever reigns. 
light of the world forever reign. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus. to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.